Welcome, everyone. I'm Ashish Kaushal, founder of Consciously Unbiased, an organization with the mission of advancing belonging at the workplace, and CEO of Higher Talent, a diversity staffing firm. Today's conversation is about how businesses can be driven by social impact while also making a profit. The role of business has traditionally been to make money and increase profits for shareholders. But as the cultural shift has made gone underway, that's been prompting businesses also to make giving back part of their mission. The reality is, I think from the beginning of time, um, doing business and being profitable and doing good is not mutually exclusive. I think it's been the reason why many companies have succeeded. Um, we have amazing leaders today showing today um, to share how they're using business for, as a force for good. Um, and they're coming from Milan, Manitoba, BC, and Minneapolis. So we have a very global audience our, our panel today. Welcome, everybody. Um, we have Sophia Yen, MD, um, MPH, CEO of Candela Health and Clinical Associate, um, professor at Stanford Medical School. Um, Brad Herangara, uh, Chief Brand Officer at Catapaxi. Um, Lisa Wise, founder of Flock DC. Uh, Tina Bodwani, co founder and CEO of AERA. And then um, Damon Morissette, Director of Social Impact in Manitoba. Welcome, everybody. So um, I'd like to start off with just um, saying, you can each state who you are and um, and share how your company's driven social impact. Damon, you want to start with you? For sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Tanse Chimagwech. Hello, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, my name is Damon Morris. I'm the Director of Social Impact at Manitoba. And I really do have the best job in the world because I get to make positive impact every day. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that Manitoba is located on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Red River Beatty. Uh For those of you who are new to Manitoba, we are an indigenous footwear brand that honors, showcases, and celebrates the beauty of indigenous art and footwear. Uh, we're a purpose-driven company founded over 25 years ago by Sean McCormick, who himself is from the Métis Nation and saw an opportunity to support his community and bring indigenous representation through a thousand years of indigenous design. Um, as indigenous people, we're taught to care for ourselves, one another, Mother Earth in general, and all living things. So the social mission came very organically to Sean and is something that connects us all at Manitoba. Um, Manitoba staff are very committed to uh, the social mission. and It's truly an inspiration for me um, and definitely makes me want to be better every day just working with some of the individuals here. So shout out to the Manitoba team if you're listening. Um, and how do we do social impact is we actively work with indigenous artisans to share their authentic stories through the design that often pays respect to their community, nation, land, and their ancestors. So it's not just a charity, charity it's about meaningful and long-term inclusion and uplifting indigenous people. Um, our impact is essentially uh, how we do business and it's communicated through our four pillars. And so I'll give you a quick brief of those, those, uh, those pillars and then pass it to the next person. Um, so pillar number one is art in action and really speaks to our commitment working with new indigenous artisans year after year to tell their stories. Um, our second one is education through change or story boot school, which is a, a really cool initiative that Sean created through his experience working with some of these artisans. He saw that some of these art forms were becoming a little bit more rare and beginning to die. So it was an initiative to support and engage indigenous youth to preserve mocks and milk luck and coffee making for generations to come. Uh, our third pillar is trade for community and, one of, and basically the heartbeat of Manitoba and, and essentially where Manitoba was created. Um, but it's an e-commerce platform that indigenous artists can come, sell their artwork and get 100% of the proceeds in return. And thirdly is sovereignty through leadership, um, which speaks to our commitment to prioritize indigenous vendors, creators, uh, marketers, and so on and so forth. So we teach, we create opportunities, and then we share and celebrate in, in, in a very uh, short, short answer. Um, but that's a little bit about how Manitoba does uh, social impact. Great, excited to have you here. Thank you. Tina, would you like to go next? Sure, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of ERA. ERA is a vegan and sustainable luxury footwear brand. Um, artisanally made in Veneto, Italy. So what we wanted to do was create a company that really took 
a 360 degree approach to sustainability in the fashion industry. I'll rewind a little bit. I've spent my entire career working for large companies. So sort of have had that front row seat into the social and environmental issues that our industry um, brings about. So started this company three years ago, um, really to show that um, what is possible and not because the world needs another brand, but we need another way of operating in the industry. So um, basically the mission of our brand is to show that style, design, and luxury quality can and should go hand in hand with sustainability. And our shoes are vegan. Um, we use all next gen materials that are locally sourced here in Italy and made by artisans. And, um, and most people who, ha who have um, experienced our shoes um, say they look no different than what's available in the market. So my hope is that through this mission and through this project, we can influence customer behavior to, um, to make the better choice um, and a choice that, that you know, has very little impact on humans not on animals and um, very little on the environment. We're B Corp certified and positive luxury certified. And um, yes, just sort of starting out now because we had a rough couple years with the pandemic, but um, uh, now the business is starting to grow and pick up and we have a little distribution um, globally at the moment. So thank you. Absolutely, welcome. Uh, and Sophia? Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Sophia Yen. My mom said, claim all your titles. So <laughs> claim all your titles, people. <laughs> I'm CEO and co-founder of Pandia Health, and we are the only doctor-led, women-founded, women-led company in the birth control delivery space. We're building the online health brand that women can trust as the only doctor-led company in this space. We will always tell you what's best for your health, even if it doesn't benefit our bottom line. And to my investors, I will absolutely make money, but I won't do it pushing something that's not in the patient's best interest. Um, the way we address social good is that we are destigmatizing women's health, that we are getting people to talk about uh, hashtag period problems. And my answer to that is hashtag periods optional. If you don't bleed every single month, then you don't have hashtag period problems. And then we're going to uh, go into acne and menopause as well. Menopause has been non um, long neglected. And it's time we talk about it because it affects women from age 50 until 80. And there may be needs to treat it as necessary if symptomatic to prevent cardiac um, brain as well as bone health. And we also have Pandia Health Birth Control Fund to which people can donate, get a tax deduction, and then it goes towards anybody who can't afford birth control pills or telemedicine. Um, we make our services quite affordable at $30 once a year to use our expert birth control doctors with unlimited follow-up questions for the next 364 days, any question you have about birth control will be answered by a doctor and the medication changed if necessary. And we're taking into consideration differences to responses in drugs by race as a proxy for genetics. But in the future, we'll look at the genetics and tailor it even more. Wow, welcome, that's, that's a lot. It's amazing. Um, Brad? Hi, Ashish, hey everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here and excited. This was a great, a great group of folks to, to be a part of. So thank you. Uh, I am the chief brand officer from Code Epoxy, which is a outdoor gear and apparel brand. Um, it's based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. It's been around for about 10 years um, and has been growing at a pretty rapid clip. You may, have, you may have come across it when you're hiking on trails or going on walks or doing climbing. Um, What's great about this company, though, is it's more than just an outdoor brand. Uh, it was a brand that the founder, Davis Smith, built on having this ideal of doing capitalism better. And so we take everything in terms of sustainability and really have hardwired it into the business. So how we operate um, and the way that we think about sustainability is, 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 is pretty broad. We think about it at this level of human sustainability. How can we have an impact, um, a positive impact on, on people? Um, our people that work for us, our partners, and then certainly people that are out in the world, um, and especially people who are in situations of, of very extreme levels of poverty. And so 1% of the revenue from Code Epoxy goes towards our Code Epoxy Foundation, which is at its heart and soul looking, uh, providing partnership um, to these amazing groups who are out in the world um, that have the same type of mission that we do to figure out ways to alleviate poverty through education, healthcare, and other life services. And so 
what's exciting about being a part of a brand like this is I love the industry. Fashion and apparel is very fun. It's like outdoor being outdoors is, is amazing. Um, but it's, it's a, the movement that the founder and the current team are trying to really instill across all businesses, mm -hmm. which is driving this conscious capitalism movement forward so that more people can participate in it and the impact could be bigger. Um, that gets me really excited about coming to work every day. So excited to participate with others who I know are in the same kind of camp. Thanks for Welcome. coming. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. And Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Wise, and I'm the founder of a bird-themed family of companies that have been managing residential real estate since 2008. And I came to that work by way of a lot of nonprofit ventures and things that I worked on, but I'd grown up all over the Western United States, really living with a, a lot of housing insecurity. I lived in 23 different spaces by the time I went to the University of Arizona in 1990. And that was a really formative experience for me and really anchored me in a sense of what housing injustice looked like um, and housing injustice even for me and what it would look like for me to, to appreciate and, and achieve a level of security and stability that I hadn't had growing up. And I'd always felt that if I could do something for myself, then it was my obligation and responsibility to do the same for something, somebody else or someone or someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, I've always put people in place uh, over profit. And so I started a family of those companies one by one in 2008, uh, managing residential real estate kind of based on a formula that I'd had uh, where I bought an Adobe duplex um, in 1996, um, over a series of really interesting um, events in my life. In 2008, I decided to do that uh, property management um, with a justice lens. And property management and justice tend not to go in the same sentence unless you're in court. And <laughs> that is not at all how we've managed our work. I believe deeply that I have an opportunity to impact people's lives in their homes. And that's an honor and a privilege and a responsibility. I understood I'm more trusted as a business owner than politicians are. My family of companies have grown. Right now, we manage two and a half billion dollars in residential real estate. And we started a housing justice foundation in 2020 that helps BIPOC first time home buyers with no strings attached down payment grants. And 1% of our profits also are assigned to that effort. Uh, we have 14 families that are not now calling a um, homes their own, which feels great uh, with more on the way. So I've also tied that to a, a, a business that I'm in now that was sort of a hybrid property technology business. And one of the thrills about that is that it would continue to advance the birdseed mission and help us support people getting into the home buying space. Oh, and I wrote a book. I wrote this book called Self-Elected, which uh, Holly Corbett wrote the foreword for. It may be the best part, but it's still worth a read. <laughs> I think we should have renamed this to the overachievers. <laughs> yes. um, so before we get started, I, I have to know, like, what's the, or I'm curious to know, what's the, what's the flock part of the DC for? Uh, when, uh, the first company that we started was called Nest and you can't have a nest without a bird. And then once you have one bird, I'm telling you, there's no going back. Um, and then coincidentally, one of the places that I did spend time um, as a child that felt just amazing and safe and great to me was at my grandmother's farm and we would wander around and she painted birds. She was a naturalist and she became a well-known watercolor artist having started that in her forties. So that was, and this is an homage in some way to her as well. Very cool. Um, okay. So what personally motivates you all to do this work? I think it's my responsibility, to be frank. I, I was um, born not dreaming of like a wedding or where I might live, but I always dreamed of my home office. <laughs> so like if I was wired, um, and that was when I was like little, little, I was like, what would a home office look like? And we lived in a one bedroom house. My parents slept, lived in the dining, like they slept in the dining room. And yet I was still thinking a home office would be great as like the next best room we could add on to the house. Um, but I was born with an ability to go out and make the best of, the worst in a lot of ways. And I, I understood that that was a unique opportunity for me to make a difference in the world. And I am able to create extraordinary jobs. I'm able to create impact in my community. I'm able to give back and put people on that place first as a model, not just for my team members who I always put forth first, but for my community at large. And I, I want to model out what it looks like to use business as a force of good. I think that that differentiates my company um, and, and honestly, just makes me a better leader. Absolutely. I love it. And just from a business standpoint, did you get more business because of that? 
I deeply believe that my purpose-driven mindset and justice-forward business model has differentiated my company and made me much more profitable. And I do measure profitability somewhat differently by the number of good jobs and the impact, but there does need to be a favorable bottom line for us, and we've achieved that. And I think we've we've grown faster and gone farther than our com- our competitors. Absolutely. Sophia, Sophia, I'd love to hear your perspective. Like, why did you get? What motivates you to, to do this work? Yeah. So. Um, hmm. I'll give you a little story. When I was 15 in high school, pre-med, applying to college, was at Planned Parenthood as a pregnancy test results counselor. And I ran a pregnancy test. And it wasn't for me. It was for a young woman who was 13 years old. And it came back positive. And she chose to continue the pregnancy. And I gave her all of her options, continue, terminate, continue and give up for adoption. And what different roads would we go from there? And if only we had provided her comprehensive sexuality education, birth control, and the confidence that she didn't have to have sex to prove her self-worth, what a different path she would have had. So I've always been passionate about preventing unplanned pregnancy, providing um, comprehensive sex ed, providing birth control, And now with Pandia Health, we are providing expert care at UCSF, Stanford, and even better than that level, wherever you have internet and a mailbox. Because I realized as an academic using my MIT, UCSF, Stanford brain, I've only done birth control for the past seven years. I've written a ton of prescriptions and I've ranked all the birth control pills. This is the public service announcement today. Know that there's 40 different birth control pills And if one of them doesn't work, there's 39 other ones. And if you have a great physician who's scientifically based, um, we rank them all from most likely make you bleed, least likely make you bleed, most likely give you munchies, least likely give you munchies, most likely give you zits, least likely give you zits. And what I was taught at UCSF and Stanford works great if you're a Caucasian female that wants to bleed every month. But if you're Asian or Black, not so good. And so we optimized it, tweaked it, and we found one that's better that results in 82% retention at a year versus the standard 55% retention. And we're starting with race as a proxy for genetics, but if you have genetics in the future, we can be like, oh, you got this SNP, this is the best birth control for you. And we're gonna use this for menopause, we're gonna use this for polycystic ovarian syndrome, we're gonna use this for obesity. So what drives me is the need to leave the world better than when I came in, and I hope that we're doing that. And if any other company were providing care at the level we are, I'd step aside. But if you want the best possible care, I think we're it. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's interesting. I never um, thought that medicine had to be custom to genetics. And I think that really, that was one of the things that came out of the George Floyd movement was that, um, that we, do, we do things catered towards one, <clears throat> one society and we actually really have to, and we're not actually all built the same. We have different different um, parts of our DNA sequencing that needs to be adjusted to medicine. Um, Brad, I'd love to hear why you do the the work you do. Yeah. Um, So I grew up, when I grew up, both my parents were teachers. And uh, much, so like in my household, learning, sharing, disseminating information, like was always a big part of growing up. And so, of course, I went into marketing instead of teaching uh, as I got older. And I will say, like, what drove me early in my career was, was, you know, how do I drive growth of a business? How do I build a brand? How do I create culture? I loved all that stuff. Mm. I will say, though, as I've gotten older, and this is probably from having kids and getting better perspective, like, I started to realize that especially when you're working in businesses, you have these amazing platforms to do really good things in addition to driving the bottom line. And for me, um, you know, working on a great brand like Code Epoxy was like that for me is like a, an amazing kind of like dream job. Yeah. But what gets me motivated every day is the broader purpose and mission that that the team and the company has um, about trying to create this flywheel of doing good leads to growth, to leads to doing good, to leads to more growth, um, and having just a bigger impact on the world than than just thinking about your business every day. That to me is like the beauty of this whole movement and where things are going. And I think we see it, right? You see it in the, in the type of talent that wants to come into companies that believe that and do that kind of work. Um, so I, I just feel like um, that is so highly motivating to me. And then I also, when I get to go home, I get to make my parents feel proud that I'm, I'm doing stuff for good and not just, not just being an MBA. Like I'm actually like have this compassion component to my job. 
but but that to me is what really is exciting and i think that the move being a part of a movement like this at this point in time when the world needs it is also yeah. is also highly uh, motivating as well absolutely i love these mission-based businesses um <clears throat> tina you're next sure um you know i feel like i i always grew up loving fashion and um appreciating it and felt very fortunate that i got to work in fashion um, my, my family's originally from india so it was not a traditional sort of acceptable role maybe after studying finance in college but i got into the industry and just felt very lucky. I also worked very hard, but I worked for three great brands and I just got to a point in my life that I wanted to use that experience um, and create a positive impact. You know, I've always sort of been more on the material <coughs> and business development side. So I like to build and create um, businesses. Um, and, and that was a lot of the work I did. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was really like using everything that I learned and, 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 setting up something with a mission to an improve an industry that is um, one of the biggest um, damagers when it comes to our planet and animal welfare and see if there was a better way to move things forward and certainly was challenging you know we went to italy and started working with artisans that thought we were insane that we wanted to use these materials that weren't animal skins and you know now they see this big future in it so you know from a people point of view it was great but in general for me it was how can we create a positive impact and, and try to shift the mindset, um, not just in our industry, but beyond that? That's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I love the sustainability. I, can, I can't imagine you going to say, we're not going to use leather and shoes <laughs> in Italy. Um, Damon, you're next. For sure. Thank you. So what personally motivated me to do this work was uh, I took a little unconventional route to being here at Manitoba. Before Manitoba, I worked in a lot of nonprofits, government, um, and various organizations that support the Indigenous community. And that's been something that's been my motivator and, and my driver in, in, in my professional career. Um, when you think Manitoba, we have the highest per capita of Indigenous people, and we're probably one of, we are the most marginalized group. Um, and, and this goes back to even legislation that was built within Canadian history. So I think one of the things is, is you know, we're overrepresented in a lot of these spaces, but it's understanding where is the, where's the systematic issue and where does that play? And so for us, the, the thing with Manitoba and that motivates me to be here is the opportunity to create representation, have Indigenous art and culture uh, across Turtle Island and, and worldwide. So representation and, and for Indigenous people to see themselves in spaces that they haven't been seen before is important. And so for me being in my current role and leading the social initiative, I'm, I'm really proud and honored to just um, lead this initiative and support my community, community in meaningful ways. That's awesome. Um, in terms of um, there's been an increase in jobs and companies posting related to environmental, social, and governance, ESG as they call it, um, and sustainability, as well as a certain companies becoming B, B Corp certified. What do you think are some of the reasons that business is placing importance on social impact so much? Um, Brad, do you want to take a shot at that? Sure. I'll take a shot. Um, I think for a lot of reasons. So number one, first and foremost, and we are a B Corp, B Corp organization. Um, it's what, it's what, you know, it's the consumers, it's what consumers want. I mean, there's a movement here of people when they're making decisions of, of where to spend their money. Um, if you can make a choice between a company that's doing things the right way um, and thinks about the planet and thinks about the society and the impact they're having um, in addition to doing good things on top of that, that to me is a, is a definite decision criteria choice. So at, at the base level for, from a business perspective, I think that's huge. Um, I also think from a standpoint, we talked, talked a little bit about this before, I think attracting talent and recruiting and retaining people who are really good. You can see that people want to seek out these types of companies that are standing for something more. Um, and I think in today's world where there's so many, everything's politicized, there's so much different conflict. Like when you can come to work and feel like you're driving against something um, that's bigger and that's important. Um, that's solving a real problem, whether that be taking waste out of a system, whether that be moving, solving, alleviating, trying to alleviate poverty in some way, that I think is highly motivating for us to get really great talent that we might not otherwise get. Um, routinely for Code Epoxy, for instance, like when we put a job posting up, 
no matter what the job is, we get over a thousand people applying for the role. In fact, last year on, on a team that I have, there's a junior designer role that we posted and had um, nearly 4,000 people apply for it. And that's because the, 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 the purpose and the mission with which this company like lives every day, it, it's, it's, attract, it's attractive to be a part of something like that. And I think we're all looking for movements we can get behind. So to me, it's, it's well, I like to say it's like it's the right thing to do, which it is. It also has business implications that I think are really important for companies that are trying to grow. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And I think the one question I just have a follow-up with, with any, if any of you guys want to talk about it is, there's this argument also saying that, you know, when you're 20, you want to give back, you want to be socially positive and inclusive and looking out for the environment. But then when you get to 50, your ship, your party shifts, when you get to 70, you don't care about any of this stuff. And like, it's more about capitalism. So I feel like that is a valid argument, but I do feel like there's this real change that's happened in society. It's, permeating across all those generations now that I don't think this is going to be like a fad of like what phase of life you're in. It's actually where we're going in society. What do you guys think about that? I don't think there's any paying it back. It's paying it forward at this point. I mean, we're all staring climate change squarely in the eye and we have something that we're going to be handing to our kids and their kids. And um, it, it is a collective responsibility with business, I think, being the most nimble to act quickly and actually make a difference. Um, we, you know, our, our politicians are generations behind at this point. They're moving backwards. Well, business has an opportunity with our, with our uh, ability to be so nimble to actually move the needle um, and leverage innovation to make real change, both environmentally and socially. And it, and for that reason, I do believe it is our responsibility to start creating an environment and a world that, that serves all people, not just people that are in the 1%. Absolutely. And if you think about it, like what you just made a really good valid point is in the, I think many years ago, we used to look for the government to be the social good or social impact person or organization, right? And so I think the and companies have always sort of been on the sidelines, not wanting to make a bet on each side because they don't want to alienate their customer base. But I feel like the last 10 years, business has really stood up and taken that that um, leadership change and, and, and embraced it and said, okay, we're going to do what's right for society as well as be profitable. And it's inspiring to see. Um, anyone else have any thoughts around this? I could go on for hours, but I'm, I'm trying to do <laughs> Yeah, no, Lisa and Brad, you guys did an awesome job. But you know, just to build on, yeah, we are in a climate climate crisis and a social justice movement, and there's an access to information available to anybody. And so, the younger generation and all generations are being more aware of what companies are doing. So, we do have a responsibility to communicate that to give them the best the best choice to choose from. I mean, people want to support companies that are on the right side of history. And so hopefully, you know, with, with presentations like this, we can kind of give people those options to support some of those brands. So. Absolutely. David, can you share? Okay. I, I make the argument that, you know, justice isn't a left or a right issue. It is the social structure we've all agreed to. It's what everyone is entitled to. It's liberty and justice for all. Um, and so to use justice as a lens for how we're approaching our business models is, is like truly an American obligation. And I think people are more aware of what that justice means. If you look at climate justice, if you look at racial justice, and you look at the intersection between the two, there's anyone that isn't impacted by poor choices that have followed us um, and, and new choices that need to get made so we can correct a lot of the things that have, have been done in the past and are still being done. Yeah, and it all rolls into economic justice eventually. <laughs> oh, Damon, can you share the indigenous concept of the seventh generation principle? and how it's baked into Manitoba's mission? For sure, for sure. No, I appreciate the question. Um, so the seventh generation principle is an Iroquois teaching that reminds us to honor the seven generations that came before us. So with indigenous people, our ancestors sacrificed a lot to ensure that our culture, traditions, and teachings were still alive today. So at one point, um, it was actually against the law to practice any kind of these ceremonial practice or celebrations. In Canada, it wasn't until 1951 that people were able to carry on and, and, and continue these, these traditions. And so one of the teachings I was told uh, working with elders and community members is that a person without their culture, identity, te and teachings is like a tree without roots. They're going to fall into things that provide a sense of belonging that might not always be good. Um, so like in terms of business and in terms of the decisions that we make today, we have to be mindful of how it affects the seven generations forward. Uh, we have a collective responsibility to make sustainable and, 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 and 
responsible decisions that benefit our future descendants. And so we need to leave the world better than when we found it, both ecologically and culturally and inclusively. And I think that's the beauty of Manitoba is that we're showcasing the beauty of a culture that some would deny. And so we hope that uh, the work that we do today would make our ancestors proud. Love it. And the paying forward concept that Lisa was talking about just a little while ago is instilled in the DNA of what you guys do. It's a perfect set segue. So thank you, Lisa, for that. <laughs> um, Tina, from a consumer standpoint, um, point of view, is it easier to say I can't make an impact, but how does social consciousness be shifting the prompt and prompting consumers to be part of the change? You know, I think it's it's sort of lazy to say that individuals and consumers can't make an impact. And um, we've got to really realize that everything we do has an impact and what and it's up to us if our impact is, you know, ethical and positive um, or not. And um, I, I love uh, Jane Goodall and, and all the work that she's done and, and something that she makes very clear often when she speaks is that, you know, realizing that everyone, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of people making a small ethical choice every day, the cumulative effect of that, the cumulative effect of that is remarkable. And so I think we need to realize the power we have as individuals. Of course, companies need to act and government needs to be conscious and legislation needs to be there. But what we do as individuals does matter. And I think reminding people of that is really important because it's it's very easy to think like, well, my my small acts don't really impact the larger problem. And so I, I think it's critical that 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 is, you know, that humans are reminded of that all the time. It's the first part. And the second part, I think, is we've got to give people options, right? You, we have access to information and, and um, you know, if, 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 if we have a choice to do something or to buy from a, a sustainable ethical company where people earn a living wage and, and products are made ethically and, and harm is minimized, then why wouldn't we make that choice? But we've got to make that easy and we've got to make that accessible. So companies and, and businesses have to keep pioneering better choices for humans to make and humans have to remember that their choices really matter. Absolutely. And I think I just have to be informed because I don't know if I ever like, and when I was growing up, if I ever thought about how something was being produced, right. But I think if, if somebody highlighted it to me, then I'd say, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. Right. Um, Once we know we can't unknow, right. It's, like it's, it's, it's about the whole education. Absolutely. So um, given that, like there's this general consensus today that the recession that's coming is going to be short and shallow. Um, what do you think are some long-term impacts for organizations that cut their budgets in DNI and sustainability right now? How is that going to affect them long-term? Because I don't know if you can fake being sincere about this at this point. Anyone's thoughts? Lisa? I, I have a lot of thoughts on this, to be honest. I have a lot of folks that were very enthusiastic about our Birdseed Foundation and saying we want to give. This makes perfect sense. And the timing of that was very as you would say, hot. Um, so it was an issue that was top of mind. People were really wanting and needing to show up um, as if nothing else is saying like the, there's some solidarity, but not necessarily making commitments. I was talking to one of our grant winners who, who said, you know, we've had, we had so many people visit our neighborhood. So many companies say, we're going to put a pocket park in here. We're going to do this over there. And she's like, we haven't seen them since. And I don't think we're going to. And in subsequent conversations I've had with people in my industry adjacent and in my industry in particular, which is like the worst when it comes to uh, the racial wealth gap. And, and we are the origin story for that saying, well, you know, the market's really bad. And I, and I look back at them and say, if you can make the investment today, you actually mean it. If you're making it when the bottom line's good, you don't because it's easy to give. Don't give the cream off the top, make it part of the actual main dish. I love that. You have to make it part of your DNA. I always say that because I think, I think the one disconnect that happened in the last few years is we've made diversity and ESG and everything a favor and not realize that there's an economic impact to what you do in that. And it's going to be a long-term economic impact to your business if you, if you do that, right? Um, Lisa, also there's Americans trust business owners more than politicians. What then is our responsibility to advance justice and equity? 
Um, it's creating good jobs. It's actually supporting whole people and not looking at people as assets. It's saying that we're borrowing, we're paying rent for our planet. I mean, we've all talked about um, Patagonia and and their 1% for the planet, as they say, just paying rent for their use of that planet. Um, we have to understand what our footprint is. There are a million different ways of doing business that can advance justice and actually improve your bottom line. A good example is we look about we look at every single procurement channel we have and we're like, great, how can we buy locally? How can we make sure that the dollars are staying in the community and impacting other like-minded businesses? And uh, we changed our entire business model to procure as much as we could locally, um, but we also rerouted our maintenance technicians, of whom I have many, um, so that it was a lot more efficient for them to buy from the local um, supplier, that they would meet us at the front where the trucks were, that we were having a lighter environmental footprint, we were more efficient, and we were keeping money in the local economy to the tune of millions of dollars over the last years. Like This is impactful stuff that is just win, win, win. Nobody loses. And when you look at justice, it's not an either or, it's not an expense, it's just a way of operating that keeps more in mind than just that bottom line piece. I love that. Brad, do you have anything to add to that? Well, back to your question on on kind of how do you how do you continue to have this as part of your your operating model when things get tough? I think it's one of those things where you you back to kind of hardwiring it in in a way so that it's not the first thing that you would cut or you'd walk away from. And I've been I've worked in, on companies and with brands where that's the case. It's like, well, this thing that we're doing for good, like it's the first thing to go when things are challenging. Um, one of the things that we built in, so that I've heard two great things of when you're choosing a company of what to work for. One, you have a CEO or your founder, or your leadership team that believes doing good is good for business. That's number one. Number two is you incent people around it as well. And so one of the things that our team, our, our great uh, people impact team added this year um, is an impact bonus. So when we hit our goals that we've established, of which they're very aggressive and they're very meaningful, um, we all win um, as, a, as, as an organization. Um, I've never worked in a company that has that before. We, I've always had, there's a top line goal, there's a bottom line goal, maybe there's a market share goal, but to have a goal and a proportion of your, of your own kind of like bonus and your own income tied to those things, th then you don't lose, you don't, you don't lose the narrative when you, when you're, when you bolt stuff like that into your, into your company. Um, and I love that because then it just, it just becomes part, like when we update on the numbers and how we're tracking on things, it's not just how are sales, how's profit, it's how are sales, how's profit, how are we driving our impact forward? Are we making are we making progress? Like, what what does it need more investment? Does it need more resourcing? And so, those are choices that become all equal versus like you know versus deprioritizing things that are really important to to the to the sustainability goals that we have. I love the impact bonus concept. I think that's amazing because it really ties doing good with economic policy. Yeah, yeah. Sheesh, I just want to do a shout out as a smaller company appealing to the larger companies um, that, you know, not only in your personal policies can you uh, exert influence, but I'm very thankful for the companies um, that have pushed back on politicians when they've gone the wrong way with respect to human rights and reproductive rights. And given what's happening in this country, I hope that companies will grow a pair of ovaries and stand up for those of us whose rights are being taken away. So Dr. Yan, can you unpack how <laughs> um, Pendia's Health Birth Control Fund works and what pro which it provides free birth control to women who can't afford it and is it helping gender equal equality? So right. birth control is so important for achieving gender equality. Not everybody thinks of birth control as related to sex, but birth control has actually allowed those of us with uteri to attain higher education. How many people with uteri could have graduated college without getting pregnant? And certainly you can get pregnant, have a child and go through college, but it's a lot harder. I made sure I did not get pregnant in college, medical school, residency, fellowship, because I knew if I did that, it would make it three to five to 10 times harder to get through that. And I needed to get through my education before I could whop out two children that I have. So realize that birth control is essential for those of us with uteri to, to attain educational equality as well as professional equality. Because if I don't get through med school, then I don't become a doctor. If somebody doesn't get through B school, they don't get to do their thing. If they don't get through college, they don't get to do their thing. And it's about getting equal income as well. 
and know that the number one cause of missed school and work under the age of 25 in a person with a uterus is bad, evil periods, really heavy, very painful. And so again, another Pandia public service announcement today is if anybody's missing work or school because of bad, evil periods, please see your doctor. We have medicines for that. You don't need to suffer. We need to even the playing ground. And then with Pandia Health Birth Control Fund, we are happy to take any donations that anybody want to send our way. Um, and people can apply who need um, coverage of their birth control pills. We don't cover the ring or the patch because they're crazy expensive and would eat all the money. One in 10 women are uninsured or have no insurance in the United States. One in three women struggle with the cost of prescription birth control, though we make it quite affordable at $15 per pack, three pack minimum, or seven dollars per pack for a whole year but the seven dollar is not the good stuff hashtag get the good stuff the fifteen dollar <laughs> one has fewer side effects for those of us that are black asian and don't want to bleed every month and then one in two young women have experienced a time that they couldn't consistently afford birth control so we are um, one of the few companies that have set up a nonprofit to address the financial needs of patients who can't you know access the services that would make their lives better. And we need to protect access to birth control because as you know, politically they've gone after abortion and up next is birth control. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, <clears throat> given that you guys have all built these amazing mission-based driven businesses and um, you're really trying to um, carry your work culture, is there any advice you can give people on how to both vet and attract talent and also maintain the culture once you bring them in because i don't think it's just bringing them in but it's also curating curating that that environment and creating policies around that so can you give us some examples of what you guys do in that in that frame tina do you want to go first sure i mean we're still a really really tiny team so there's just a few of us but um everyone is 100% aligned with the mission, right? So people want to be a part of a company. Actually, I just hired someone here in Milan and because of our mission, because we're better for people, better for the planet, we're vegan, we're different. So I think that today, um, you know, I think you know quite quickly if people are aligned with you and your mission and if they are, I think they work that much harder to, you know, ensure that the message is, is shared with a wider audience. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and for me, I think it's critical as a small company, as we grow that, you know, we create a team that everyone shares the spirit by which the company was founded upon. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we're one, one of the things with code epoxy is it's a, it's built on a remote work strategy. So while there's a, some of the people are down in, in Salt Lake. There's a lot of folks that are across the, the country um, in different places. And so maintaining culture when you're not all together is, is always going to be a challenge. And so um, there's a lot of, of really kind of, I think, meaningful and intentional work that happens that when we are brought together, we talk about the culture. And of course, for us, culture, a lot of it is the impact work that we do. So that's a huge part of conversations that we have when, we, when we're you know, together as a broader company and even individually with my marketing team. We'll talk about the goals and impact and how we're trying to integrate and where it's happening and coming to life. So keeping those things top of mind and then having conversations about it, I think is really crucial. And then also just rooting it for people as you, you we're, we're kind of in a high growth stage as well. So as you bring new people in, how you bring them into the culture, how you bring them into understanding the problems that we're solving and why we're solving them for impact um, is a great way for people to build their own awareness and then figure out how they can jump in and be part of the part of the solution. Um, so I think, I think your question is really good. Attracting is one thing, but retaining and building and scaling of that talent and of, against, those, against that mission um, is just as important. And to be really intentional about how you do that and how you do it pretty consistently and constantly um, is, is, a, is a leadership challenge. Yeah, and I agree. I'm glad you brought up the fact that you're, you're making sure they understand the, the mission of the business and then what, how they fit in and what, the why. Because I think I remember growing, growing up in school, like I, I learned how to solve an equation, but I didn't understand the purpose behind it. And so then I didn't really buy into whatever I was doing. And so um, one of the things that we we advise through consciously and bias with clients is like, if you want to attract women in your organization, it's not just about attracting, but it's retaining them. And so you have to create policies that align with them. So like something simple as um, women are still the primary caregiver in, in the home, right? And so if they feel guilty that their kid has a snow day, they have to drop them off early, but they drop them off a little too early because they, they want to be too late to work. 
neither side of the equation is happy, right? And so turn it into a, a results thing rather than I need to be here at a certain time or a certain day at work, right? And so as long as you get the work done, then then it creates a more welcoming environment so they actually get retained and you see the ROI on on this on these initiatives. You're you're totally right. And and keeping that flexibility. And so then yeah, you're right. You're building building those things into your system. So for us, like there's no set number of vacation days. There's no you need to take time off to go to a doctor's appointment to pick up your kid to do to take do whatever. It's like it, you have that flexibility. And because you're working from home, you're just you're able to be able to do that more easily yeah. anyway. And so you're right that those types of those types of policies really come through to like enable people to, to be successful in that versus trying to fight a system that's really key. Because because for like us, like every company, we want more women, we want the right women diversity, we want the right BIPOC, we want all of that stuff, but you have to create the right conditions to make it to make it to make people be successful in that system. Yeah. And the bottom line is if you have to babysit somebody, they're probably not the right person in your company. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> great point. <laughs> Dr. Yana, I'm sure you have some thoughts around this. Yeah, as a mother, as a, a, a pediatrician, adolescent medicine specialist, um, I just want to put out there, look at what time you schedule your meetings. So in medicine, often they'll have grand rounds at 8 a.m. And if you have grand rounds at 8 a.m., then a parent has to stay at home and deal with the kids and drop them off. And another parent has to sacrifice. But why should either have to sacrifice? If you schedule your meeting instead at noon, then everybody should be at work by noon <laughs> and the kids have been off to school, et cetera. And we as a society need to share the taking care of children. And so this is a Dr. Sophia Yen special. Um, as long as I did input, which was breastfeeding, I made sure my husband did output. So until you can do input, I'm not doing output. And they're like, why are you making your husband wake up every three hours to deal with the baby? And I'm like, why do I have to wake up every three hours to deal with the baby? It's 50% his baby. He might as well wake up too, rather than me suffering all the burden. And so I tell everybody with a uterus who might be having a baby, if you do input, the other person does output, make it 50-50 because it's 50% their child too. So realize that it takes two to create a baby generally, but, um, and if there are two, you need to share it equally. It should not be on one person or the other. One person shouldn't have to do all the housework. One person does the finances. Each person do what they're best at and split things equally, but be very aware of what time you schedule your meetings because 8 a.m. is not family friendly. Wow, good point. <laughs> Lisa, your thoughts? I, I mean, seeing each team member as an individual um, and meeting them where they are instead of asking them to meet you where you are is kind of the key question and I uh, around how to how to be thoughtful around and responsive to your team's needs. Like we don't have companies without our team members. So it's my job to serve them so that they can do their best work so that things work out well for everybody. And if I'm shoving them into categories or boxes or work schedules or whatever it is that doesn't work, um, then that's unreasonable and it's an unfair expectation and it's lacking empathy. And if I'm telling my everybody in my company to have empathy and I'm not empathic, that's not a good look. So you have to practice what you're wanting your team members to model as the sort of the, the person number one who's who's saying like, this is what what is equitable in our workplace. Um, and there are so many, uh, it's almost I would almost consider it a microaggression, but not on purpose, where we dismiss or diminish certain kinds of workers over other workers. Um, someone said recently, like, you should, you should just go ahead and let all of your employees work remotely. And I just raised my hand over here. I'm like, you know that there are a lot of people that cannot work remotely. So how are you creating parity for those team members? Like all of the techs that are at the hospital, they're not getting choices about when those meetings happen. They need to come and work with their hands and be there in person. So there's a lot of language that business owners will use that creates division or disrespects and or dismisses people that make the work work. Um, and we need to create opportunities for them to, to appreciate and enjoy us embracing their unique needs. So one of the things that we did with our tech, our techs, um, is ask them, is there an alternative schedule that would work better for you where you have a shorter work week, but you have more time then like, how can we minimize commute? What are the pain points for you as you're doing this work? Do you want to, and do you want a buddy person? Like there are a million things you can do to just listen to who you're working with and learn something from them. and and, and work on meeting them where they are. And there's some things that you just can't do, um, but there's a lot you can do. And if it improves morale, that cost benefit always pencils out favorably for the, for the company and for the leadership. Interesting. So you're saying make your environment work for your workers to be able to work. Yeah. 
And and that also gives you the right to say, like, suck it up, folks. You gotta come to work and get our hard thing done. Like, it doesn't mean you can't ask for hard things. And it doesn't mean that you can't ask for people to pull out all the stops for something that really may require that. But not everything is urgent. Not everything is, you know, we're not doctors. Um, we are not, there's nobody, so, sorry, Sophia, Sophia does, <laughs> 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 but like there, there's some limit, like we treat people as if there's like this, this epic urgency around what they're doing when in fact, like sometimes they just need to take a nap <laughs> and so like go do their own thing. I was, um, it, Mackenzie Scott has been giving all these like, you know, general operating, like here's some cash. We don't need to tie all of these requirements to cash for nonprofits. And she had said at one point, maybe people who've been working in nonprofits need to just take a nap. And that would be fine if that's what they want to do with this money. Um, that is being very thoughtful about why the money is needed in the first place, why people are working and how we're here to help their, their lives be rich and full, not mm -hmm. to steal from it. No, absolutely, those are great points. When it comes to um, to marketing and branding, how are you all using purpose or social impact to connect with your consumers? So I, I want to share about what, what Manitoba is doing because I think it's really unique. And so, like our social mission and the brand are intertwined; they can't be really separated. And one thing that we've seen through data is that through engagement, uh, postings of our social initiatives and, uh, and indigenous culture in general, that engagement goes up, which results in sales, which results in a bigger impact in community. Um, but our marketing campaigns are, are built around the seasonal artists, so they kind of determine the story. Uh, so in spring 24, uh, all the design elements in our products are from a particular artist. Um, we invite them to join our indigenous market to use as another source of revenue but to also give the opportunity for people who are big fans of the, these artists to get handcrafted goods from them and 100% of proceeds go back to them. Um, we also we also create an opportunity for them to teach uh, at our story boot school to facilitate workshops either in retail or in their home community to provide a consumer experience or to pass on some of that knowledge to the next generation. And then when it comes to the storytelling or the, or the sovereignty through leadership pillar, is that we utilize their network. So community of indigenous models, photographers, videographers, and other creators. So people who are really familiar and connected to that individual to tell their story more authentically. Um, so we try not to just be a brand. We believe like we're a movement that brings together people through storytelling and just then to celebrate the beauty of, of, of indigenous, indigenous arts. I love that. Um, Brad? Uh, yeah, I, Damon, I love that. That's a great example. Um, you know, it's, I think what Damon just said, like almost the marketing and the brand work is inextricably tied with the impact you're trying to make is when you're in a great zone because you, you got to think about those things in a connected holistic way. And those are my favorite ideas to actually market behind. You know, whenever you write a, a brief for a team to go kind of like find a creative solution, like the biggest part is like how you set up the problem. So it's clear what the problem is. So people understand it. Um, and for us, a lot of the times is it's usually an impact problem that's being, that's being teed up. So one of the, one of the product collections that we have is called Del Dia Code Epoxy. And it means like of the day. And what the output looks like is this amazing, these, these packs and bags that are these amazing, colorful one of one items that you can buy. So hip packs, backpacks, duffel bags, and they're made everyone that's, that's put out into the world is, is unique. So the color combination you, no one else owns it, just you. And so that uniqueness, just from a purely consumer perspective, is really amazing because you can buy whatever color you know combination that you love that speaks to your own kind of like persona and passion. The cool thing on the back end of that, though, is that program actually started because um, of a huge issue in the apparel industry, which is dead stock material, which is like going to be material that's going to go into the landfill because certain manufacturers can't use it. And so that's material that Code Epoxy see sees as an opportunity to, to buy. So it doesn't go into waste. And then we create all of these different colors that then our factories, the workers that, that are there that can create with them, basically decide what color combinations they want to put together. So zippers, pockets, straps, they choose and they create something that's going to be unique and different every time. And so what I love about that is that there's a there's a great consumer angle to it, because if you want something unique and colorful, you can get it in all these various ways of great packs. But then there's a sustainability angle at solving a really huge problem in the industry and making something really beautiful and marketable out of it. And so we we're telling that story in a way um, that's, I think, really compelling and, and, and interesting. And again, that's the kind of marketing I love because you're not just just selling an item for the sake of it. You're doing something good that can that people like and want to hear about. But they also want an output that they can as a consumer buy and feel really good about, too. So 
that for us is kind of that that's a great example because we try to bring that mentality to almost any kind of marketing brief that we have yeah i love that the, both your examples kind of show that you if you package your passion it resonates with consumers and they'll they'll buy it definitely and and we're thoughtful because i think a lot of there's always this, this tension in marketing right it's like if you if you if you survey people sometimes they'll say i want responsible brands but like at the end of the day i'm buying if i'm buying a shirt or i'm buying a food or i I want it to taste good. I want it to look good. And so you have to deliver both of those things because they are spending money yeah. for it. But when you can figure out how to put them both together, that's when you have the magic, you have a magic solution that, that that's making impact. And again, we're business to, to do more good. So we've got to sell, we've got to grow to do more good. And that that's when that starts working together really well. Yeah. But I also think you have to be sincere about it. Yeah, it's got to be an authentic problem. And that's why I was saying like, if the problem's not real, if it's not a real problem you're solving, then you're, you're kind of, you're, you're kind of grasping at straws. And that's why I think like understanding, you know, one of the things that we look at when you talk about like ESG broadly, there's a lot of companies that talk about e-environmental. For us, we look at all of the, all of the parts to it. Like we, we are an outdoor brand. We use the environment. People go out and are experiencing the outdoors. We have to care about the climate. We want to care about it, but also the social impact and the people impact that we have is equally important. And then how we govern and are transparent about the work that we do so we can share it to others. So we think about humans, that's what I mean by human sustainability is holistic. You have to believe that to your point. You have to believe that. And then you have to understand what problems you can solve within that to achieve your mission. And once you get to that, to the problem to solve, then the creativity and the solution comes forward. And that's when you're like really like starting to make things that are really pretty epic. So, but there's a lot of work to go into that to set it up so that you are authentic and not just trying to chase things that don't necessarily matter. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also important um, to have a very clear outline of what it is that you're trying to do when it comes to your, you know, you know your justice-based or purpose-driven or be corp-driven responsibilities. I'll have a lot of people that say, well, I know you're helping with down payments, but what are you doing with seniors who are living in homes that need repairs? I'm like, I'm helping with down payments. <laughs> um, I can just do the one thing here really, really well that nobody else is doing. So we, we will direct people to all different places, but this is a unique problem that has no solution and we'd like to stay there. Um, because once people do understand that you care about the whole, they want you to do the whole thing. <laughs> um, and it's fair to say, no, we know we can move the needle in this category and we're gonna align and, and orient our resources in that way because we can make a difference meaningfully versus watering down all this stuff that just like doesn't stick or land. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to share a business tip in that the way we connect with consumers via social impact is we donate to nonprofits that support um, that aren't anti-woman, anti-birth control. And so any nonprofit, you know, that isn't anti-woman, anti-birth control in the United States, come our way. We're happy to set up a referral code and we're much rather write you a thank you donation than send it off to Facebook or Google ads. So that is a way that we, one, get recognition through the nonprofits, but also help nonprofits. And I'd much rather give it to a nonprofit than to Google or Facebook. I also like what you both Great. have kind of said, because you're, you're, you're solving one problem, you're trying to solve everything, right? And so because you're able to solve one problem, you're able to do it deep and well. And I think that's one of the things that, and that's why everyone has a place to, to, to do something here. And I think one of the things you guys started off with in the beginning of this conversation was like, what can I do as an individual to make an impact? Like, how does that really work? And is it really gonna make a difference? And if you really take a step back, it takes a thousand individual t um, tasks or e efforts to make a big impact in society, right? And so it's not one person that does it, but one person can be the catalyst to make, sh make stuff happen. Mm -hmm. So we have this thing called micro progressions, which is called um, it's small action steps you can take to support each other and make a work in a better work or environment or just life a better place. An example that I taught myself during COVID was I was used to just uh, try to push my point across on Zoom calls because you're not doing it in person anymore, right? And so what that would do is cut people off, and what and that subconscious message was that you're not important to me, your ideas aren't important to me. So now I actively listen. I pause, I respond to the question you're asking rather than the one I'm wanting to give to you. <laughs> and so, and that makes it more inclusive. So um, it makes teams run more more efficiently. And so what are some small action steps or micro progressions that you think we can share with the audience that will help support your social justice initiatives? I think people should just be more curious, frankly. <laughs> I love that one. I agree with that. 
I'm going to do a plug for put your money where your values are. So given two companies that are equally the same, go for the one that's women found and women led, given that women found and women led is less than 3% of VC funding out there. And for those people that um, have the means, invest in women founded, women led. And for those people who are in philanthropy, know that you can invest in women founded, women led through Impact Assets, which is a donor advised fund. Um, and uh, check out fffl.co, female founded, female led.co. It's a list of female founded, female led companies. But ask who the CEO of the company is ask who the founders of a company are, ask who the owners are and what are their values? Cause that's who you're supporting with your money when you choose one company over the other and every dollar you spend can have an impact. Are these people standing up when we need them to stand up or are they just in the background kind of quiet and asking your brands to stand up when we need them to stand up? Absolutely, I love that. I've got two quick ones. One I think is um, like just, just sitting here and listening to all the different perspectives just in one kind of panel. I think the most successful kind of like work you can do is when you find partners that can help you solve a problem together. So find like, that's one thing we, we bring in partners all the time and give them like every month and, and hear a different perspective. Cause you, you only know so much about the, the, the thing you're trying to, to, to charge against and other people learn. There's so many experts out there that can add value. So finding the right ecosystem of partnerships can allow you to like, just move better and solve things more, more, I think more elegantly. And then the second piece is like ideas on these types of, to solve these problems can come from really anywhere in your company or organization. So really, I think if you, if you're a leader in your company trying to create the space um, for what Lisa kind of said, being curious, but create the space for having conversations about things that people don't understand or to challenge ideas. Like these are, these are, these, some of these topics are really tricky and sometimes they conflict in terms of like priorities. And so creating the space that you can have those, those, those positive, dialogue or uh, conversations to get the better outcomes, I think is really important. Absolutely. I can share a quick little story too that has been extremely helpful to me as a female founder um, trying to solve a problem in the fashion industry. You know, when I, when I went out to fundraise, it was shortly after COVID and it was, a, it was a tough moment. So we figured out a way just to keep our company going by cutting expenses and so on. And then, you know, um, about a year ago, I went back out again, and, and what I decided to do was take a different approach. And I think we've got to just, if we're solving problems that haven't been solved and we're doing something that's never been done before, maybe there isn't just one approach to fundraising, right? So rather than um, going out to VCs or, or larger investors, I said, if I could create a community of women that like what I'm doing, that understand my mission, that are influential, then they can help me build this business. And today I have 14 women on board and they're global and they're all sort of in different areas from law to finance to, um, to impact. And it's been remarkable, the community that's helped me build and spread the word and grow this company organically. And, you know, I call it the era family. And it really was, it came out of a moment where I didn't know really what, what to do because we were still too small for, for a bigger fundraise. And, and it's been the most rewarding thing I've done. So I think there there aren't just one there isn't one route when you're when you're doing things. And sorry, that's someone at my door. I'm here in Italy, and I think we're over our hour. But I think it's about thinking differently. And and if we're going to solve a problem that's never been solved, we've got to think of solutions that have, are different and unique that benefit us and help us move forward. I love that. It's a great example of, of thinking outside the box too. Last but not least, Damon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so one thing I would I would encourage listeners to do is, you know, to familiarize yourself with indigenous history. Um, we're one of the fastest growing demographics and we're growing businesses five times faster than any demographic. So there's there's a lot of entrepreneurs, businesses that are being created right now. So to be familiar and learn how to work with indigenous people is very important uh, because we're going to be sitting next to you running some businesses and there are going to be partnerships that benefit our community as well. Um, but if you want to make a direct impact, um, sounds a little bit of marketing, but uh, you know, visit our website and, and know that a portion of proceeds go to support this, the Story Boot School. But if you want to make even more impact, check out the Indigenous market and support some of these Indigenous artisans and entrepreneurs to grow their business and create awareness and tell their story with one-of-a-kind pieces of art. So um, that's kind of what I would, I would leave at, but uh, okay. thank you. Great. Thank you all for this amazing panel today. Uh, we're honored to have you. It's awesome.
All right. Have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Bye. a lot.